What's up guys and welcome back to Mon Inc. If you guys are new here then what is up? My name is Erica. Hey, how you doing? And if you're into the history of the ancient Greeks and the Romans, maybe you're just into the mythology and maybe, maybe you just want to see me fangirl about book 10 of Homer's Iliad because it's exactly what's gonna happen this episode. Well, if that sounds like you, or maybe you just want to fangirl about book 10, that's also a possibility and that's also acceptable, then you're gonna want to hit that subscribe button and the bell icon so you know every single time I post in the future. But I just ruined exactly what the topic is of today's video because today's topic, today's video is going to be about book 10 of Homer's Iliad. Book 10 is iconic and if I could summarize this incredibly iconic moment into one sentence it would be Diomedes and Odysseus at night tearing up the Trojan camps that's exactly what happens that's all they do it's the middle of the night and they just they do their night raid this is what this book is famous for it is famous for the night raid and honestly the night raid is one of the most famous scenes in the entire poem like literally people read the Iliad just to read the night raid. It is epic. It is amazing. It is one of those scenes that after you read it, like I won't be doing it any justice in this video. I'm just going to fangirl the entire time. As you guys know, I don't have notes when I do these videos. I just tend to blather a lot. I will probably not do it any justice. I do highly suggest that you go and read it because the chapter isn't that long. It's not the shortest one that we have. I think book six is a bit shorter than this one, but Book 10 is fairly short in comparison to say book five. That's a really long chapter. So we're not even on that sort of length. So I would advise you go read it, but why don't I just like dive into the action and start fangirling already because that's so exciting. So book 10 opens with everyone asleep, right? We're in the Greek camp and everybody is asleep apart from Agamemnon. Agamemnon is wide awake and he clearly has like some mad anxiety about the war because he's aware of how close the Trojans are like on the other side of the, the wall. He's super aware of that and he cannot sleep and he doesn't know what to do and he wants to go and ask Nestor for advice. That's that's his, his big grand plan in the middle of the night. So he decides to put all of his armor on to get ready. And as he's doing that, we then hear that Menelaus has the exact same idea that he can't sleep either. And he wants to go in and relay some information. There's a thought that he's had, which I'll say in a second, that he wants to go and tell Agamemnon of this plan. So he walks all the way to Agamemnon's head and he sees Agamemnon getting ready and he's like, oh my God, wait, you can't sleep either. Twins, this is so cute. But I'm actually here on a mission. So he has the idea that he thinks one of the Greeks should go to where the Trojans have camped and sort of like do like a night spy thing. And he's like, but the idea of getting one of the Greeks to do that would mean that he would have to be super brave and it's highly unlikely we're gonna find someone to do that because it is a dangerous job. Like this is not an easy ask of someone, but I think it's it's necessary. Agamemnon says that this is actually a really good plan. He's actually like, dude, that's a solid plan. And he agrees because he thinks that Hector, considering Hector is immortal, we need to remember this, that unlike Achilles, you know, Achilles is half immortal. Hector's not and Hector's still causing this much chaos, this much chaos. And Agamemnon has said that he's never heard of a mortal man causing this much frenzy on a battlefield in, in any sort of war at any point in history. He's like, this is like the first time that we've seen anything like this. He's absolutely insane. So we need to call a council to ask everybody else what they think that we should do. And maybe, you know, they want to do the night raid as well. So he then tells Menelaus, he's like, look, I'm going to go and find Nestor. And I need you to go and get big Ajax because we love big Ajax. Get Idomeneus, also while you're at it, you can get Nestor's son, who's also a good uh, warrior. And Meriones, Meriones is... Idomeneus is like second in command. I don't know if you've watched all the other episodes, but so they're part of like a package deal. He's like, get them too, because they're really great warriors. And then, um, yeah, we'll have a little council. And as Agamemnon goes to leave, this is actually one of my favorite parts of the whole book. As he goes to leave, Menelaus from behind him is like, wait, dude, bro, where's the council being held? Where am I meeting you? Are we coming back here? Am I coming to find you somewhere in the camp? Am I just gonna find you walking around? Like, what's your grand plan? And Agamemnon turns around, he's like, oh, that is, yeah, yeah, good point, actually. Um, I think that if you're gonna try and find me in the camp, we'll just be chasing each other for hours, that seems a little bit useless. So why don't we just meet back here? That sounds like a good plan. And he leaves. But I love this moment, I really love this moment because it is so human and mundane. It's the first time in the book that we see anybody planning anything, really. And it's just like this really funny moment where you wouldn't even, Consider, like, I think as a reader, I would not have considered that moment. Like, well, you know, where are they meeting? Well, I would just think that Agamemnon had implied they were going to meet back at his tent. But I love that even Homer made sure that Menelaus clarified this. <laughs> even Menelaus is like, where, dude? What the f***? I love that. I think it's just so, ah, oh, love it. So while Menelaus goes to find all, the, you know, the four men that he's been told to find, Agamemnon goes to wake up Nestor. And when he goes into the tent, 
sort of as he's walking towards where Nesta is. Nesta like sits bolt upright and he's like, who are you? What is your business? What are you doing in my tent? It's too dark to see. And Agamemnon from the corner is like, hey dude, <laughs> it's me, Agamemnon. Um, I was hoping to see that you were up and it looks like you are, so that's like totally great. I have some questions. I'm a little bit anxious because of the whole, you know, battle war thing that we're involved in. Would love it if you could come and have a chat with me and some of the other dudes. And Nesta's like, oh, actually sure. Yeah, that's like a great plan. I think that if you want me to come and have a chat with you though, we need to include Odysseus and Diomedes because they're like great warriors. Um, So we should go and do, we should go and get them. And he also mentions little Ajax and Megas. Megas we haven't met yet, it's fine. He comes up later, but he, yeah, he, he's just really noted in war as opposed to like being an actual character. Little Ajax though, I told you we had big Ajax and little Ajax. This is now little Ajax finally does something. Not really anything yet, but he's present at least, which is sort of important. And actually after he says this, after Nesta stresses that they should go and find these people, he then just like starts slating Menelaus. And he's like, look Agamemnon, you're really great, but your brother is lazy it's the middle of the night and you have to go and find all these people we still have to go and wake up to four more people honestly we have to go and wake up four more people to bring them to this council and we should also actually invite big ajax and idomeneus but their ships are all the way on the other side of camp and we can't go and get them and these people will be up all night so your brother really he's got to start pulling his weight and agamemnon sort of waits for him to stop and then is like right so normally I'd be on your side of course like you're really smart you're really wise and you know menelaus is actually pretty he will not do anything unless I tell him to do it or unless I do it first, then he follows in my lead. He's really annoying in that way. Gotta admit, you know what, Nesta, you're on a roll here. However, he is awake and he's actually gonna go and get those guys. So we can't say anything bad about him right now. And in this instance, he is pulling his weight. And then Nesta's like, oh, okay, that's okay. Let's just go and wake up Diomedes and Odysseus. And Agamemnon's like, cool. So Nesta gets dressed and Nesta goes to get Odysseus and Diomedes. So he first of all goes to get Odysseus and he, he goes up to where Odysseus is in his tent and he sort of like nudges him awake. <laughs> like he has a sort of moment where he's like, Odysseus, wake up. I would love it if Nesta actually had made this like action. This is how I picture it, that he's like sort of standing quite far away and he's just sort of poking Odysseus to wake up and he's like, hello, I'm I'm here, but but please don't be scared. And Odysseus rolls over and bites his head off. Literally, Odysseus rolls over and he's like, what are you doing rolling around the camps in the middle of the night? Like, excuse you, some people are trying to sleep. And Nestor is like, okay, don't bite my head off. <laughs> I'm here on a mission. Um, I need you to come back to this council because we have this whole thing that we need to talk about and we need you there. So get yourself together. We've got one more person to pick up. Um, but yeah, so then Odysseus is like, okay, fine. He gets all of his stuff on and then they go to wake up Diomedes. The difference between how Nesta wakes up Odysseus and how Nesta wakes up Diomedes is night and day. It is so funny. And the reason why I think that Nesta was like this is because, you know, like waking up Odysseus by like kind of awkwardly poking him is because Odysseus clearly is not a morning person, right? What I just described to you is not somebody who enjoys the morning. He's pissed as that he got woke up. Whereas Diomedes, probably isn't gonna react. As we've seen, he very rarely reacts in an emotional way anyways. And so when Nesta walks in to wake up Diomedes, Diomedes actually isn't in his tent, that all of his men, they're outside of the shelter and they're just sleeping outside. And Nesta just like walks up to Diomedes and goes, wake up, why are you asleep? Can you not see that the Trojans are on the other side of the wall? And poor Diomedes literally wakes up with a start and he's like, what? the hell man like jesus could they not have sent anyone else to come and wake me up he's like why are you the one to come and wake me up could there not have been someone younger someone nicer why are you yelling at me like literally diomedes you can tell is just like oh my god and nestor is like oh you're wondering if there are younger soldiers to go and wake up the other people that we need for this meeting funny yeah you i need you to go and wake up little ajax and megas so go do that and literally diomedes is just like Okay, fine. And so Diomedes goes to, to do that. This is like the toughest man. This is the scariest man. All the Trojans are terrified of Diomedes. He is the scariest man. He is like top dog. And people just yell at him all the time. And I love it. I think it just adds to his character. Oh, that's my man. So they all arrive at Agamemnon's tent now, right? So they're all in there and Nesta's like, it's so nice that you all have gathered here. It's great that you haven't been able to sleep because now we can all not sleep together. Now let's keep this theme going because the Trojans are right f***ing there. So plan. Nesta presents the plan of asking them if somebody will go and, you know, get all of the intel from the Trojans in the middle of the night. He's like, this is what we need. Is anybody willing to go? And everybody's silent because everybody's like, why in the world would any of us want to go by ourselves to go and do this? And naturally, who stands up? <laughs> You'll guess it. It's Diomedes. Diomedes stands up and he's like, okay, fine, I'll do it, but I'm not doing it alone. Like, f that. 
I will go though, but with somebody else in this room. And hearing this actually, loads of them start offering themselves up. So we have, what is it? Um, Odysseus offers himself up, Ajax squared. So both little and big Ajax offer themselves up. By the way, no classicist is Ajax squared. I just said it on the spot. Never say that in a classroom. They'll be like the f So little and big Ajax. Um, both of them offer themselves up. Meriones does and um, Nessa's son. So they all offer themselves to go with um, Diomedes. Agamemnon is then like, look, Diomedes, you can actually choose who you want to go with you. And so he's like, well, duh, I'm gonna choose Odysseus. He chooses him for some good reasons too. He says that he chooses Odysseus because one, they're good mates, which like is as good a reason as any. And two, because He's favored by Athena, which is obviously really helpful to know that a goddess would be watching over you. So that's a reason. And then the last reason is because Odysseus is good at things that he's not good at. So he's like, actually we work really well as a team. Um, so I definitely want to go with him. Odysseus stands up and he's like, sick man, but we should really go because already two thirds of the night has gone through. So we only have one third of the night and we don't want to be there when like the sun starts coming up. So we should like go now. So the pair of them go to get all of their armor on and get ready and all of that sort of shebang. As they leave the Greek camps, they can hear a heron. So they can't see because obviously it's dark, but they can hear a heron and that is sent by Athena. So they hear this heron, they get some comfort from the fact that Athena is with them. And in this moment, that's when Odysseus first, actually, he starts praying to Athena and he's like, hey, remember that I'm your favorite. That would be really great if you could like stand by me right now. Woohoo, please help. And Diomedes then hears this and he's like, oh, I should probably join in. So he's like, hey, Athena, remember that you like really love my dad. So if you could like totally be with me in the same way that you were with my dad when he would do things and help me, that would be really great. And obviously, Athena hears them. She doesn't hear anything the Trojans say at any point in this book, but she does hear this teeny tiny little prayer that comes out of them. Now, as this has been happening in the Greek camp, right? So this whole thing, this whole meeting thing has been happening in the Greek camp. Literally the exact same thing has been happening with the Trojans where Hector has not let anybody sleep. He woke everybody up and he wanted someone to go and do the same thing where he wanted somebody to go to the Greek camps at night by themselves, except Hector, unlike Agamemnon and Nesta, he's offering them all of these great gifts. He's saying, you know, like when we sack them, you'll get X, Y, and Z and blah, blah, blah. And he does list them all off. So all of them know what they're getting themselves into. Watch me trip over my words. So they all know that. And this random dude, this rando guy called Dolon is like, I'll go do it, that's fine. Now Dolon is noted, just like a random side note, Dolon is noted as being like evil, evil to look at. I hope that means he's ugly as f but if there are any classes who understand what evil to look at means, then please let me know in the comments below. If not, I'ma take it as him being really, really ugly because it's just my favorite thing when Homer starts describing people as being really ugly. I think it's funny. So anyways, Dolan offers himself up, but he wants to make sure that Hector is serious about these gifts. So he's like, before I go, you have to swear with your like scepter thing. Um, that I'm gonna get all these gifts. So Hector's like, okay, fine. And so he does this this oath thing with a scepter. And then Dolon's happy. And so Dolon starts moving as well. So now it's the middle of the night, guys. Okay, pitch black outside. There's literally nothing but like wasteland of where they've been fighting. Diomedes and Odysseus are coming from one side and Dolon's coming from the other. And as they're sort of running towards the middle, Odysseus puts his hand out in front of Diomedes and he's like, yo, there's a guy there. What the f***? So instead of, of actively like scaring him, Odysseus is like, we don't actually know what he's what he's trying to do. So why don't we let him run past us first and then we'll go and catch him. Cause if we catch him this way, it's too obvious. So they sort of like scuttle back into more so the shadows and sort of let Dolon go past them a little bit. And then they start chasing him. Cause then they're like, Mah. The chase has begun. Now when Dolon first hears the footsteps behind him, he assumes that it's actually some of the Trojans chasing after him, right? Because they've come from behind him. So he thinks that Hector has sent somebody to remind him to do something or whatever. So he stops and he turns around. And as Diomedes and Odysseus get closer to him, he realizes, Shit, these are Greeks. I'm f and so he starts booking it. He starts running and he is sprinting, you guys. He's so fast to the point where Odysseus and, and Diomedes now have to really pick up the pace and they've got to try and get him. And so Athena then comes down. She like breathes this courage into Diomedes as he's running and he ends up throwing his spear so that it goes right over Dolon's like right shoulder. This is on purpose, by the way. So he purposely misses Dolon because they don't want to kill him, right? This is the intel. He is the intel that they need. Diomedes does this and it goes with such force that it like lodges itself in the ground. It's like right Right in front of him. Dolon literally stops because he's so scared. He's like, the f was that? Now, because he's paused, this gives the boys enough time, the boys, the men, this gives them enough time to run over and to grab onto him. They've now grabbed his arms. They've the 
pushed him onto the ground, like the whole sort of shebang. And um, Dolan like right on cue starts crying. He's like, no, take me alive. I'm super rich and I have loads of gifts for my ransom. And Odysseus is like, look, don't even worry about that yet um, because I got some questions for you to answer first. So first things first, where are all the Trojans sleeping? I want to know like what the whole order is of sleeping Trojans. I want to know what your business is being out here. Like, are you coming to destroy the camps? Like what the whole shebang is? Are you acting by yourself or did Hector send you, you know, like he has like a long list of, of things that he needs to know. And Dolan just sort of starts like rifling off answers, right? So at first he's like, Hector's corrupted my thoughts because he said that if I did this for him, then the gift basically that was on offer was that it was Achilles' horses, which are like these incredible horses. I told you that horses were a thing. They're a thing throughout. We're running on book 10. We have 24 chapters of this book. They don't stop being a thing. So he's like, I was promised Achilles' horses when we like destroyed your camp. So that's why I'm doing this. And Odysseus' response is actually quite chilling because he starts laughing. Like he sort of like smiles and like laughs a little bit. And he's like, <laughs> What an odd prize for a mortal that you would want Achilles' horses considering they're designed for the son of an immortal. You know, you can't just like <laughs> control them. But the way that he's saying it is not like a, <gasps> how could you take them? It's like the way that he's saying it is, <laughs> Good luck. But again, he stresses his question. So again, he wants to know, you know, like the sleeping arrangements. He's like, how are you guys sleeping? You didn't answer that question. You didn't answer if you're like staying put or going back to the city. You know, like there are lots of, of questions that haven't been answered. So he again crumbles, Dolan crumbles, and he starts answering all the questions. And he actually goes through how everybody is sleeping. So from the order of like the sea, you have, you know, like these people or these people or these people. But then he's like, well, if you want to know who the easiest target is, it's the Thracians, because the Thracians are all the way over here, but they're by themselves, they're isolated. So all of them are sort of protected by each other, whereas the Thracians are all alone. And obviously we get a little horse's note because Dolon is like, the king of the Thracians is this guy called Rhesus, and he's got the nicest damn horses I ever did see. So if you want an easy target, it would be them. He begs them to spare him right after this. He's like, I've told you everything that I have to tell you. So please spare my life. Just tie me up and leave me right here. That's totally fine. You don't even have to let me go back. And Diomedes replies and Diomedes is like, in what world did you think we were gonna let you live? Like you're a dummy if you genuinely thought that because, which he stresses, which is correct, so he's like, if you go back now, let's say even if we leave you here, if you remain alive, you're either gonna come back and destroy us and be one of the people who's going to burn our ships, or you now have this intel and you're gonna go back and then come back to spy on us. He was like, nah, we're just gonna avoid all of that. Um, So no. And Dolon starts crying. I mean, he was already crying, but now he starts crying even more. So he's crying his eyes out, the whole sort of thing. And he's like begging, he's trying to supplicate. So he's trying to like grab onto Diomedes' knees to like beg him to leave him alive. And Diomedes chops off his head, straight up. Like mid-sentence, he is mid-sentence. Dolon is begging and Diomedes is like, shut the f up. And to the point where Homer describes that when Dolon's head hits the floor without his, his body, you know, obviously, that when his head hits the floor, it's still talking. Like that, <laughs> what? Obviously this doesn't sway either of them. They actually just start taking off his armor because obviously that's what they do in this book. So they start taking off Dolon's armor and then, um, what's his face? Odysseus, <laughs> what's his face? Odysseus holds it up to the gods and he's like, Athena, this is for you, thank you. And so then they leave it there. He will come back for it later, but he's obviously not gonna bring it all the way to the Thracians and then bring it all the way back. And it's like, ah, that's a lot. So he leaves it there. He's gonna come back and dedicate it to Athena in a hot second, but he leaves it there and then they start running. This was me making both Diomedes and Odysseus run towards the Thracians. Now when they get there, all the Thracians are asleep. It is literally the ideal situation. Okay, so they get there and they're like perfect and Odysseus like hits Diomedes and he's like, yo, look at those nice ass horses that Dolan was mentioning. I'm gonna go and get those and before you like actually start your whole killing thing, I'm gonna like untie them so that we can take them with ease when we start killing everybody. And Diomedes is like, yeah, sure, whatever, I don't really care. So he goes over to do that and Diomedes just starts killing the lot of them. Like he does not stop killing until 12 people are killed in their sleep. He's just like, die, 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 you can die, you can die, you're too close to me, I don't like you, stabs the lot of them. And Athena does breathe all of this courage into him in order for him to, to go through with all of this. Cause I mean, not that he really needs it, but it's always nice to know that Athena's on your side. So he's killed 12 people who are asleep. Now 13, including Dolon, and then it's quite funny actually, because all of these bodies who are like on the floor after they've been killed, right? Blood's all over the place, guts are all over the place. And Odysseus, bear around, he's still focused on the horses, right? So he's like, well, how are the horses gonna get out of here if there are all these stupid dead bodies in the way? So he then sort of comes into the middle and starts like pulling them aside by their feet so that there's like this, 
this track for the horses to come out of the camp. Once again, another little funny logical note so that we know how the horses got out of the Thracian camp that Odysseus, as Diomedes is killing people, is like, oops, sorry, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna move you, I'm gonna move you. Diomedes is so in like the zone that he then goes to kill Rhesus. He stabs Rhesus the king in his sleep. He stabs the king. Like, what? Uh, what? And as he's doing this, Odysseus has already hopped into the chariot because Baron has moved everybody out of the way. So he hops into the chariot and then he whistles over at Diomedes to be like, come through. Okay, we're done here. And Diomedes does have a moment where he doesn't know if he's supposed to stay and kill more people or whatever. And so Athena literally comes down and is like, all right, buddy, pack it in. You've done your bit. Now get in the fucking chariot. And so Diomedes, knowing that it's Athena, he's like, oh, okay. And he hops in the chariot. And as they ride off back to the Greek camp to safety, Apollo has watched this happen. And Apollo, unsurprisingly, not happy because he's on the Trojan side. And he's even more pissed at Athena for being a part of this. So he then encourages Rhesus's cousin in the Thracian camp to wake up. So he wakes up. Imagine that. Imagine waking up and just seeing everyone dead around you. So he's like, oh God, this is not good. And so he goes to wake up all of the rest of the Trojans so that they can see the slaughter that has been caused by the Greeks. Odysseus and Diomedes, meanwhile, they have to go back first of all and pick up the um, armor that they left, like Dolon's armor that they left. So Odysseus is the driver. This is me being the driver of a chariot. You can tell I've never done this before. And then we've got Diomedes who hops out to go and get it and then hops back in. Diomedes has not once been the driver this entire time. That's very interesting. But anyway, so then, then they hop back and then they go back into the, the Greek camp. When they get back to the Greek camps, Nestor is the first one to speak. He actually worries as he sees the chariot approaching because it's a, a Thracian you know, chariot. He's worried that it's not actually them and that it's like the Thracians who are coming in or whatever. So he is actually really terrified when he first sees them. There is doubt. Can you believe there is doubt that Diomedes did not do this job effectively? That to me is just shocking and slightly insulting. And I'm like, Nesta, come on, my boy, my boy got this. Nesta's first question is actually, how the did you get the horses? Like, these are really nice horses. Did you get them? Did a god give them to you? Like, what's the whole sort of thing? And Odysseus explains what Diomedes did in the Thracian camp. And he's like, we would not have these if it wasn't for Diomedes literally killing the lot of them. So we should already be applauding them. And then they walk, the horses actually, they walk all of them over to Diomedes' tent where Diomedes already has all these other horses. Bear in mind, we have spoken about all the times that he has stolen horses from the uh, Trojans. So he then sort of ties them up near the other horses that he already has. And all the Greeks cheer because they love Diomedes. Meanwhile, Odysseus then takes the armor of Dolon. So they do get something each. He takes Dolon's armor uh, back to his tent and his ships and then he um, like offers it up to Athena as like a, a thanks. Thanks for not letting us die and for like actually being there for us. It's really chill of you. So he does the whole like wine pouring thing. And then, yeah, it's the end of the night. And so they're now chilling in the camps. And that's the end of the book. That was book 10 of Homer's Iliad. It's not actually as long. I might've made this video a lot longer because I fangirl the entire time. This book is epic. It is just so cool. I think it's part of the the whole thing that it's like nighttime and they're doing it as well. I know that sounds really dumb, but like literally all the other scenes, all the other fighting scenes are done during the day. And these guys have the courage at night, in the middle of the night, to go to the Trojans. And they're like, these guys can suck it. I just, oh, I love it. I think it's so good. And I would say that you guys have to read it. This video doesn't do it justice whatsoever. I can't possibly do it justice, even though I can swoon about Diomedes all I possibly want, which as you guys know, I do all the time. So, yeah, I would highly suggest that you read it. I am putting lots of like Iliad books in the description below. So in every single um, video that I produce actually at the bottom, there is a link to either one of these books. So I have all these books piling up that there will be a link to one of these books, whether it's a translation or a helpful book like this one up here for you guys to go to in regards to the Iliad and what will help you guys actually read the text aside from my silly videos because they are just that, they are silly. So um, yeah, thank you guys so much for tuning into book 10. If you guys enjoyed this, then don't forget to hit that like button so that I know that you guys are vibing with this whole series. And um, unfortunately, we'll be seeing you next week for book 11. I say unfortunately because it's not as cool as book 10. Book 10 was like the peak coolness, the peak hilarity, the peak logic. I just, ah, it's so great and I'm really sad it's over. So yeah, we'll see you guys next week with more Iliad stuff here on Monique. We'll see you then.